Hi there, welcome to Fostering Resilience. I'm Dr. KJ Foster. In today's video, I'm sharing with you an interview that I just conducted with Dr. Rob Kelly. I think you're in for a real treat today because Dr. Kelly is not only someone who has successfully recovered from an addiction to alcohol, but he is also someone who has worked in the field of addiction recovery for over 20 years, helping thousands of individuals. He is the founder and CEO of the Rob Kelly Recovery Group with a ton of credentials. And so he's sharing both his personal experience, his personal journey, and his professional experience. So I think you're really going to enjoy it today. If you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, I create videos that are all about supporting the recovering community. So be sure to click on the red subscribe now button. And when the bell pops up, if you click on that little bell, you will be alerted to all of my upcoming videos as soon as they're posted. I post videos every single Monday and I generally post a second video at some point throughout the week, either a meditation, or some other educational video. So that way you click on the bell, you'll get alerted every time I post a video. So definitely subscribe and let's go ahead and get to the interview with Dr. Kelly. Welcome, Dr. Kelly. I'm really excited to have you here and to be able to interview you today. And I think everybody is in for, for a real treat in terms of being able to learn from you, your history and your experience. So with that, if you could just start by sharing with us who you are, where you're from, you know, any type of details you're, um, you're open to sharing. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. It's looking forward to it. It's gonna be awesome, absolutely. My name is Dr. Rob Kelly. I am an addictionologist. I'm also a uh, neuroscientist and I specialize in addiction and alcoholism. That's what I do today. I have four practices around the world. Um, I have a book out there, mainly on alcoholism. And I live in San Antonio, Texas, despite the accent. I've been there for 13 years, but I'm originally from Manchester in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can you share what your, your book is, The Daddy, Daddy, Please Stop Drinking, correct? Yes. That, that was the last thing my daughter said to me, uh, 20 20 something years ago was daddy daddy please stop drinking so it's available on amazon only uh, it's basically my story with some twists and turns in it and also a lot of education on alcoholism i've uh, i've studied the brain and alcoholism for about 27 years now and there's a lot of that stuff that you won't find on google or with the medical fraternity a lot of the stuff is my findings over the years so it's very interesting Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to you sharing some of that with us, but let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to what happened with you. You know, what, what led you to, to become addicted to alcohol? Well, I took my first drink. I, I, I was in, from a musical family, uh, poor middle class, maybe. So at the age of nine, when I was playing with my auntie and uncle on stage, uh, I got stage fright and my uncle gave me a drink. And as soon as I taste the drink, my whole world just changed right there and then at the age of nine. So I know now, but not know then, was that was my alcoholism. I was born an alcoholic. I'm born with the addictive brain. I have self-sabotaging neural pathways, uh, which will destroy me if I'm not careful. So my drinking kind of took up for age of nine, even though I drink Friday and a Saturday night, um, as I went through schooling, uh, it kind of gradually become Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. And as I went into college, it became every single night. Now, I was uh, a session musician at Abbey Road. So mm. I played with Alan John, David Bowie, Queen, all them guys. So mm. the money I got from that, I put myself through college. I'm the only person to go to college in my family. I went to Oxford University and I studied there. And then my drinking really took off. And from then was about 10 years of absolute hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when, when it took off and it became absolute hell, what was the defining moment for you? If you could share a little bit about that, um, that period, and then what was the defining moment for you in terms of starting to turn it all around? It was the, the crossover from, because at the moment I'm still drinking, I'm still drinking daily as a, as a heavy drinker. 
not too sure where I crossed the line from heavy drinking to alcoholic drinking or alcoholism. Uh, there's a fine line there when people cross it, it's very hard to come back. So let me first explain that if you're a heavy drinker, you could possibly stop or moderate if you're given a good reason. So if the doctor says, hey, Johnny, if you don't stop drinking, there's a possibility you might die. Or the wife says, hey, if you don't stop drinking, I'm going to leave you. Or you can moderate or stop, that's fine. But for the alcoholic, when you cross over the line, it's not as easy. In fact, it's virtually impossible to just stop drinking. So heavily drinking, never thought I had a problem. Here's the crazy part. I never thought I had a problem, despite some of the stuff that I did. Some of the stuff that I did is shocking. And I'm going to uh, tell you a couple of things, but I'm not going to get into detail in case it scares viewers and listeners. But I remember leaving my kids in, in a cinema while I, I went in back into the foyer and was, was gobsmacked to realize that there was no liquor store nearby. So I drove 10 miles in my car and left my eight, eight children, ages one and three, in the cinema because I needed to drink. When I got back, the police were there, all the lights were on. It, it was horrendous. And I remember one night uh, coming downstairs. This is during my heavy, heavy drinking. Now I'm drinking alcoholically. I'm drinking every day and I'm waking up searching for a bottle the next morning. I remember one morning I was searching for a bottle and couldn't find one. I knew, this is crazy about alcoholics, we all knew if we'd left some over from the night before, despite how drunk we are or how blacked out we are, then I knew I'd left a quarter of a bottle. So I went downstairs to find it. And sure enough, I found it in a cupboard that I'd hidden it in. So I took the bottle out and I put it on the counter for a second while I turned to get a glass. I mean, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not going to take it out of the bottle. I'm going to get a crystal glass. And as crystal glass makes it all nice, you know, makes it acceptable. So I got a crystal glass and I'm just about to turn around and grab the bottle and my wife had followed me down and she grabbed the bottle off the side and she said, Rob, I think you've had enough. Let's think about that for a second. My, my, uh, my fourth bottle within 48 hours, I was due to drive to work. I was well over the limit, the drink uh, legal limit. I had a board meeting in a few hours. What I should have said was thank you, you know, Mrs. Kelly and went back upstairs and, and slept some more. But I didn't. I took a kitchen knife out and stabbed her three times. And as she went into intensive care, I went to Spain and disappeared for three months. Now, that was pure alcoholism. I don't remember doing it. Uh, definitely not me. I would never do that. Mm -hmm. But that's where alcoholism took me. Mm -hmm. And within, I came back three months later, but within six months or nine months in all, I'd lost my wife, my kids, my houses, my cars, my holiday home, my business. Mum and dad wouldn't speak to me. Parents uh, just disowned me. Brother and sister threw me out. Friends threw me out. And I, I became homeless. And I stayed homeless for 14 months. How, how old were you when this I was happened? around 25, 26. Mm -hmm. Maybe a bit longer. It's all a bit hazy for me back in those days. Maybe 28, 29. Mm -hmm. I'm not too sure. Mm -hmm. but, and then when I say to people I was homeless, they... They usually go, oh, well, that couch surfing, you know, it's really tough. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. I was living under, in bus shelters. I was living under park uh, benches with cardboard boxes. So I was really homeless. But I went down to about 120 pounds. Um, and I'm a, a big bodybuilder guy. So it was, I was dying of I was starvation on the streets. I was dying of untreated alcoholism. And I, I, was, I took so many trips into the hospital with alcohol poisoning. And then I tried to commit suicide six times. And twice I was successful. They actually brought me back on the streets. They had the, the shock things and they brought me back mm -hmm. um, to my dismay, I must admit. Because I got to the point in my life where I couldn't live without God. I couldn't live without it. Right. Nobody would speak to me. The abandonment was rife. The shame was just unbearable. Sure. And, and I, I just couldn't get over this. You know, the remorse was just what I'd done to everybody around me was just, I couldn't live anymore. You know, but some higher power or something had different plans because I had them all mapped out. I remember standing on top of a, a 25 story building, uh, stood on the edge, the actual lip on the edge I'm stood on. I'm going to drink the bottle of vodka down in one and then I'm going to fall forward and, and that's going to be it. And I was so excited when it was happening. I was drinking this bottle and going, thank goodness for that, it's going to all be over. Mm -hmm. And I drank it and somehow fell backwards and, and woke up and realized that I hadn't fell at all, that I fell backwards, and I was very, very annoyed with myself. Mm. So that's kind of the thing, but I remember one morning, it was 2.30 in the morning, 
And I, I know this because I asked somebody after it, because uh, the guy that helped me, but I dropped down to my hands and knees and I started to cry from my belly. I was sobbing and I, I wasn't sobbing because I'd lost my wife and kids and everything. I was sobbing because the first time in my life I realized that I couldn't stop drinking. Mm -hmm. And I looked up to the sky and I said, if there's a God up there, I can't do this on my own anymore. And 20 seconds later, a guy walked around the corner. He'd missed his last bus home. He'd been walking for about four hours to get home. He came across me. He said, do I want help? And I said, yes. And my life started to get better and better from then. And here I am today, four and a half thousand miles away from home, living the dream. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, because what you describe, Dr. Kelly, is you describe the classic, I mean, classic, um, I think, depiction of uh, somebody that we're taught as a child is, is an alcoholic or, or an addict. And, and that's not, you know, that's not everybody. But that is where that took you. That took you, yes. it sounds like, to, you know, living under the bridge, so to speak, not having anything, you know, trying to kill yourself over and over again. Um, and, and now, you know, and, and the transformation that, that happens as a result of recovery is yeah. just incredible. So describe what, what happened, what you started to do that, that changed everything for you. Well, the, the guy that called around the corner was named Derek. And he said, you can stay at my house tonight. I went back to his house. He fed me. I took a shower for the, for the first time in eight months, I think. And I shaved. And uh, this by this time, it was 6 a.m., so we got some sleep. And then we had breakfast. And he said, the only requirement to stay here is to come to a 12-step meeting, to go to AA meeting. Now, I tried them, and I disliked them so much. It's just mm -hmm. a bunch of guys bragging how much they used to drink. Um, mm -hmm. But I had to go. So I went. I remember sitting there um, bored and about, in England, you have to share around the room. You don't just pick mm -hmm. out people. And right. about halfway around, I remember a guy with a white beard and white hair saying, my name's John and I'm a recovered alcoholic. And I thought, my goodness, what did he just say, recovered? Uh, and then he started to talk, but he would, he would reference the big book every time, which is the best piece of literature I've found on, despite spending 20 years at, at uh, college and school. Um, the best piece of literature. And he started to point this stuff out that was unbelievable. So mm -hmm. after the meeting, I walked over to him and asked, could he help me? And he said, yes, I'll be a spiritual advisor for a period of 12 weeks. And that's what we did. I, I, he said, get a big book and a dictionary. And every Wednesday evening, I would walk eight miles to his house. It took me ages to walk to his house, but I couldn't afford a bus fare. And I would walk there every week on a Wednesday for 12 weeks I did that for. And at the end of them 12 weeks, I had a spiritual awakening and a psychic change. And therefore, my DNA changed. So I was a different person. Mm -hmm. So he taught me everything in this book and everything about alcoholism that other normal people didn't really know. And this, this spurred my, my, my journey into what alcoholism is and what the addictive brain is. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is about two weeks after that, I got my first job. Because he said life will take on, you know, go out and work with people. Mm -hmm. And I would carry this book and I was talking and telling people this book and people were absolutely amazed. How did you find this out? Oh my God. It's... So after two weeks, I bought a little teddy bear from a gas station and I bought him a little card and I wrote on the card, thank you, John, for introducing me to this amazing life. And I walked the eight miles back, as I'd done 12 times before, to his house. But when I got to his house, I knocked on the door so hard that the next door neighbor came out. And I, I said, she said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, can you tell me where John's moved to? Looks like he doesn't live anymore. And she said, there's been no one in that apartment for at least three months, which I thought was crazy. So after she shut the door, I didn't want to embarrass her. So after she shut the door, I sneaked around to the guy on the left and said, and I knocked on his door. And he came and I said, can you tell me where John's relocated to? And he said, there's been no one in that apartment for at least a year. And I've never found that guy. I went back to the meeting. And I said, do you remember, guys, the guy in the corner, I spoke to John, he was like, I don't remember you speaking to anybody. I remember you over in the corner, you know, kind of talking to yourself, and, and you know, we thought he was praying, so we left you alone. And I'm like, no, the guy was there. I've been to his, I've been to his house for 12 weeks, he was there, but nobody can recollect, and I've never found him since. Wow. That's incredible. But the knowledge that I learned from that guy that was passed on to me was incredible.
-hmm. the knowledge that I've taken into the medical fraternity on the studying of the brain is absolutely breathtaking some of the stuff we know so what it, so what share um some of that with us i mean what were the key elements that that he shared with you he was talking about the hypothalamus for those who don't know it's in the back of the back of the head in the brain just near the prehistoric brain he, ta he talked about the the normal hypothalamus which is a fight or flight part of the brain mm -hmm. as, as you know and uh, secretes into the brain the uh, natural existence of of men and women and that is the basic instinct is to drink water and eat food and that's what it does but not so with the alcoholic the alcoholic um it creeps into that fight or flight is to drink alcohol then the prefrontal cortex agrees with that straight away and, and it makes sense because you know alcoholics can go weeks if not months without eating or drinking water they just survive on alcohol so that, that made a big difference to me right. the other thing as well was there was the uh, psychic change the change of mind and that we can redirect neural pathways. So my findings was that uh, I have I have self I have shown people this. I have self sabotaging neural pathways. That I mean there are billions in the head, but let's say these is, is the the ones I'm using on a daily basis. These will self sabotage anytime they can. This is the guy that's going to get drunk. He's going to take off with your wife. He's going to steal your car. This is my normal thought pattern. And these are the stuff that we build here at Rob Kelly Recovery Group. And to start is like this. So what we what we tend to do is we want to finish like this. So that this isn't the immediate reaction. This then becomes immediate reaction, which is self care, you know, time to think, redirection. But I found there is a time frame here once we get well, and the time frame that we we found out is seven point three seconds, and within that seven point three seconds, one can redirect self sabotaging neural pathways, mm -hmm. and this has been tried over about ten years with about five hundred. Uh, alcoholics that we that I worked with, so that 7.3 seconds is phenomenal because that's what he told me. There's there's something missing, you know, in the world of alcoholism, and and you will find it, and and that's what it is. We can redirect. And 10 years ago, the medical fraternity comes out and goes, "Oh well, we believe that uh, the, the brain is plastic. We can redirect and, and remold, hence neuroplasticity." But I was doing this 25, 26 right. years ago from right. what this guy had told me. Mm -hmm. So combined with my research and combined with my schooling and my experience, which is, was vital, we found out that, you know, you can't cure alcoholism because it's, it's a daily reprieve that, that one has, but there is a certain system that you can put into place. Now, how do I back that up? We are the only company in the world that will give you a refund in full if you relapse. Nobody else does that. How can we do that? Because we're so sure of what we do. Mm -hmm. That is manageable. You just what it, alcoholism is nine tenths of the law with alcoholism is knowledge, mm -hmm. because alcoholism will never come to the alcoholic. Let's say on a Monday and go, "Hey, Johnny, let's drink today." It never does that. It's a week, if not a month, before mm -hmm. when you start acting up, when you start listening to the self dialogue, when Mary in the corner is now a pain in the backside because you don't like her, and little Johnny over there keeps using that silly red Christmas pen that his mum bought him. Why can't I use a normal pen? That is my relapse. Mm -hmm. And if I don't take care of it there and then, when the actual drink gets picked up and put in my mouth, I will not be able to give you a good reason why I've done that. Right. And that information changed the addiction world. It's so from that moment on, after that experience where you, um, you know, were basically attempting to kill yourself and, you you know were taken uh by that gentleman to to live in his home and then the whole 12 weeks and all of that have you run into any difficulties since then or has it been all pretty much um a progression forward since then since that no time? That, there's been a couple of instances where i got very complacent mm -hmm. and i stopped doing the work and i stopped working with others mm -hmm. And there's been three instances where I've walked away from the, from the addiction field and tried to lead a normal life. And with that comes complacency and with them come a relapse every time. So I found out that despite what I want to do for a living, this is my destiny. And this is what I'm good at. So I jumped back on the horse again. And, and one was like three hours. And I realized what the heck am I doing? Right. So I jumped back on and I started working my program again. 
and working with others and uh, it's, a, it's a guaranteed process. But you see, alcoholism isn't my problem. Complacency is my problem. Mm -hmm. You know, complacency will get me every single time, especially where I am now. I mean, it's all there. It's all here. It's psychological. Mm -hmm. The only job the prefrontal cortex has is to come up with a solution as quick as possible to the problem. Mine is alcohol every time. Mm -hmm. Every single time I hit a goat, it'll be a drink. I remember driving down uh, Manchester after about 10 years sober. I'm in a convertible car. It's a hot day. I looked over to the right. There's, there's two couples. You know, the men are about 50. The girls are about 30. I take it it wasn't the wives. They're drinking champagne. They're laughing. You know, the girls mm -hmm. sort of laid back. Right. You know, and, oh, it was just a great picture of, of summer, you know, drinking. And my head told me that those were the days. Mm -hmm. Those were never the days for me. Right. I would have salted them women somehow or said something horrible, fought with the doorman, and then fought with the police when they came, and they would have took me to jail or hospital. Mm -hmm. But my head never tells me that. So right. that's when the 7.3 seconds comes in, and I have to go, wait, those were never the days, Rob. Mm -hmm. Think what the real days are. Think where this is going, and that will redirect into a great thought pattern. And then 7.3 seconds passes, and then the fleeting thought, as they call it, is gone. And it might not come again for another year or so, but you mm -hmm. have to be on guard when it comes. Exactly, exactly. You have to be strong. And there are things that, in just the way that I think about it, there are things that we do that keep us strong, you know, and other things like complacency, which then starts to deplete the strength of being able to endure those 7.3 7 seconds, did yes. you Yes, three seconds. So what else for, for you, um, aside from um, the complacency, and it sounds like, you know, working with others, doing service, would, would you um, identify any other major um, issues when it, when, when it came to your experience with relapse, or were those the, the two major ones? No, the, the biggest one was honesty. When I started, well, two things really. Honesty, when I, when I started to tell little tiny secrets or little lies, as small as they may be, right. they will grow from there. My brain says, okay, to do that. Now, um, I was taught to lie from a very early age with my mom. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much my dad, from my mom. You know, we don't live in this horrible house on the project. Right. If anybody asks, we live in the nice houses over there. And I would often, someone would come up and go, hey, Rob, my dad's picking us all up to go and play soccer tonight. And I would go, oh, great. And I would give the name of this nice house. And 20 minutes before they were picking up, I would run from my, my horrible house, as mom called it, to their nice house. And I would wait outside. Yeah. So they thought I'd come from this nice house. And then they would drop me back off at 9 o'clock. I would have to wave and walk up to the door before he would pull off. And then he would run back to my house. We got taught that at an early age. So I've got to watch for them lies. Right. My had said from hereditary, it's okay to lie. And the other very, very important one is self-dialogue. Mm -hmm. So if I drop a pen on the floor, I'm not a stupid idiot. I've been saying that for years. Oh, yeah. what a clown, what an idiot. My subconscious brain will grab hold of that and hold that against me until the time is right. right. So it got me thinking about three years ago in America, in, in Dallas, uh, we, a patient just left me. He was driving home. And my assistant came in and says, oh, my goodness, Dr. Kelly, you know, David L., uh, is, is that father just died in an accident, a car accident, it's tragic, can you call him? So I called him, I said, look, David, pull over to the side of the road, and I give him this horrible news. Well, he was sobbing. I said, are you okay to drive? I can't drive, I'm shaking like crazy. And I think he actually wet himself because all his nerves had gone. I mean, he couldn't control it. anything on him, he was sobbing. Yeah. And I said, I'll call you back later, and I've got another patient. And I put the phone down, and my assistant come, she didn't even knock on the door. She come running through the door, and she was pale. I said, what's going on? It's not John L., it's John B., whose father has died. So I'm, oh, my goodness, you call John B., I'll call John L. So I called him back. Anyway, we made it right. But I'm sat in my chair after, and I'm thinking to myself that John B. lost all control over his body, he had no control over his sobbing. His whole life had just fell apart, and yet there were just words on the end of a phone. Right. Which takes me back to the old uh, schoolyard song of, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's false. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Now, words and self-dialogue will kill me stone dead if I'm not careful. Right. Because I can talk my way into self-sabotage any time of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, and that's the element of shame. I mean, that is, is really shame in and of itself is when we're attacking self or when we're feeling that somebody else says something to us and it's, and it's directed at self, which is why I personally um, try to stay away from labels because label makes it so much about self rather than the behavior. And, and I, and I, realize that in some instances it's important to really identify and accept uh, the the truth about your condition but when especially when it's used by other people in describing their loved ones you know that's when it can really be damaging and and put the the person in a position of making it more difficult for them to get well definitely i 100 percent agree with that in fact, we don't call it a, a mental illness. We call it a mental injury. Oh. Yeah, Rob Kelly recovered it because we believe it is an injury and you can't get over it. It's not yeah. an illness that you're stuck with forever. Right. You know, it's, um, it's, it's very important that, that we put words of encouragement into our patients. Like when they say, well, this is impossible. I don't argue with them. I just said, you've missed an apostrophe out. And they go, what do you mean? I said, you misspelled it. It should be impossible. Stick that apostrophe in there. Yeah. Nothing's impossible. And of course, some of them will say, well, I can't be president of the United States. Well, today I beg to differ. A businessman has taken over. He's not a politician. So you can become anything that you want to become right. as long as you can visualize it. Yeah. I read also that you are certified in neuro-linguistic programming, which yes. I think is so critical and so important when you're when you're working in this field because the way in which we word things is so powerful um, especially when it comes to to addiction so I that's something that I've always wanted to do I just you know haven't been able to it hasn't been the right time moment <laughs> place for for that to happen it's a phenomenal um, tool yeah. there's two things I find interesting I have a PhD in behavioral science as well Mm -hmm. Uh, just because you can't take out the body without dealing with the mind as far as we're concerned in addiction. But the practitioner NLP and practitioner of somatic experience, which is also looking at the body. Mm -hmm. So when you look at facial features and you look at the thought patterns, you can change them thought patterns based on how someone is feeling. And that's why our telehealth, which we've been doing for eight years, has has taken off with a 97% success rate because people feel better when they're at home. They feel more relaxed. And therefore, you can read them. And the other thing with the alcoholic, what we tried as well, which is very interesting, is when an alcoholic says, I'm going to give up drinking, because I said it so many times when my first child was born, I'm going to give up drinking, I'll never drink ever again, lasted four hours. But we took a bunch of people, like 10 people into our practice, who were sworn off. That's it. My wife said, if I don't stop, that's it. And we had an inkling that they were alcoholic, and we put each one of them on a lie detector. Mm-hmm. And, and Dr. Foster, everybody passed the lie detector. Yeah. And yet, two weeks later, everybody had relapsed. Wow. So at the time, they really thought it's like a compulsive liar, right. a clinical liar or something. It's like pathological liars. They're, they will walk through a lie detector because they right. truly believe in what they're saying. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what the alcoholic is right. like. So all this information that we have, we had to put it all together and find out exactly what we're dealing with. I needed a full knowledge of alcoholism because even today, uh, I'll walk into a room, AA room or or a medical establishment, and I'll say to my doctor, uh, can you describe an alcoholic? And most of them will say it's somebody who drinks too much alcohol. Well, we think that could be furthest from the truth. Alcoholism has got little to do with alcoholism. It's Mm -hmm. a mind, it's an inside job. It's just a symptom. The bottle's a symptom, I have a mental injury. It's a bit like, I always say to somebody, it's like you're having chicken pox. And somebody comes up and says, oh, Rob, I can see you've got chicken pox. How do you know? I can see the spots all over you. Right. Now, that's the symptom. What I'm suffering right. from is a viral infection. Right. That at my age can kill me. But you don't see that. You just right. see the symptom. And right. it's the same with alcoholism. You see the bottles, but you don't see the disease. Right. And that's why I, I, you know, I work with a lot of family members and and that's why I think it's so important for not only the individual, but the family members to be educated because you can't see it. And the, and the, 
what happens is the family members, even the individual who's struggling with the injury, I love that, I'm gonna use that moving yeah. forward. <laughs> the individual who's struggling with the injury, because you can't see it, I, I describe it to the family members like this. When, when, you, when you have an injury, any other injury, right? And you go to the hospital and you come out and generally when there's a rehabilitation process involved, there's going to be a cast, there's gonna be crutches, there's gonna be a wheelchair, you know, one of those where you can visually see that the person is injured. When you are struggling with alcoholism or any type of drug addiction, you can't see it. You can't see the injury. And so the, the, um, what happens is the family members think that they're, they leave treatment and that they're okay and that they're fine. And that's really when, when recovery is just beginning is when they leave treatment. And yet the family members will expect them to jump right back in to, to, to work, go to school, you know, take care of the kids again, take on all of the responsibility, not realizing or recognizing because they look okay yeah. that there is a tremendous about amount of rehabilitation that still needs to take place regarding that injury yes it's true it's when my mom had cancer about the same time i was suffering from alcoholism and we'd go into the house and everybody would care for her bring her flowers and you know and i'm like well i have alcoholism it's the same thing i'm dying, dying right now there's no cure for it you know and it will kill me if i'm not careful mm -hmm. but, but people just don't see it and the other thing is that people miss out as well is whatever is alcoholism is always trauma. Now, somebody said to me once, well, that's not always the case. No, it is, if you think back. But then again, we have to define trauma. We believe anything less than nurturing as a child is child abuse. Mm -hmm. Don't do that, you stupid idiot. Get down as bad. Don't be silly. You can't do that. You're not old enough. We take this on board right. and we keep it in our subconscious brain until the conscious brain is ready to use that against us. I'm talking about the addictive brain now, although it affects everybody. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the addictive brain. And that's when our mapping of the brain gets distorted. So when we get into adult life and, we, and the alcoholism starts to take off and everybody, including my father, if you just pull yourself together for your children's sake, you know, stop doing that for your mom's sake. You know, she's suffering from cancer because you keep, you know, you're living on the streets. Right. I mean, nobody can understand because it's one of the most misunderstood illnesses in the world. And to make it even more complex, it's the only self-diagnosed illness in the world. Right. 10 DUIs does not make you an alcoholic. You know, there's something happens when I take alcohol in my body that doesn't happen to the normal person on the street. Mm -hmm. And this is what we were fighting against. Rob Kelly Recovery Group as a team, yes, we deal with, with like, an, like an executive IOP. Each individual program is different, though there's a basis be in the back of it. We want to, first of all, educate the families. So when somebody comes to us, the alcohol and drug, it's a money back guarantee. That, that we'll guarantee that. But let's look at your lifestyle. Let's look how we can move you forward. Let's go back to the scene of the crime and clear that trauma up because it will keep going to destroy you. Oh, and by the way, when we're doing that, let's get you back with your wife. Let's get you back with your kid. Let's get that job you've always wanted because that's what it's about today. To, to come from where I've come homeless to here, with four practices around the world, you know, books, TV, all the stuff that I do is virtually impossible. But one of the reasons why I'm still doing what I'm doing is to say, look, guys, if I can do it, you can do it. And it's all, and this is what we do with guys. We make them visualize what you, what you can achieve. We often say to people, if we could swap places for five minutes, all your problems would be over if you could see you. Right. You know, if you could see what we're capable of, if we look at quantum physics as a proven science, let's take a basketball court, for instance. Quantum physics tells me that I can be 25 places at the same time on that court. So if that's the case, where would I want to be? I'd want to be over near the goal so I get the ball, stop it in the hoop, and I'm the champion of the, of the game and the hero. How do I get there? I walk over and take the position. And it's the right. same with anything with life. If you can visualize yourself there, don't ask for it, don't interview for it, walk over and take that position. And the power of the mind is absolutely phenomenal. Because when I came to America, there's a couple of things I wanted that people laughed at. I wanted to become, I wanted to be on TV. I've never been on TV before in my life. I wanted to be on national TV with viewers over 3 million. That was the thing. Check. I wanted to write a book that was going to be one of the best sellers. Check. 
Mm -hmm. All this stuff that I've achieved, I wanted a million dollar house. I wanted to drive crazy cars. I wanted to be able to give at least $250,000 a year back to the community, which is what we do today. We, we, uh, we, we buy gifts for one parent families. We buy cars, we'll pay rent. Mm -hmm. And I visualize it and then I made it happen. I walked over and took the position. It's amazing. It is amazing. I have a, a visualization that I use as a part of my relapse prevention program, and it's about visualizing yourself recovered. And what does that look like? Like, what do you want that to look like? So, yeah. um, yeah. And I love the word recovered. I mean, if people get freaked out by that sometimes, I always say, well, first of all, recovered, was it me? Definition of recovered to gain one's health and state of mind back. So that's all I want. I'm not cured of anything. But I also look at it like food poisoning. I had food poisoning once, I went to the doctors and he said, Rob, you've got food poisoning, take these pills, drink lots of water, in four to three or four days, your food poisoning would have gone. So I said, is there a cure for food poisoning? And he said, no, let me give you a few simple steps though to make sure you never get food poisoning again. And he talked about checking dates and not refreezing stuff that's already been frozen and I've never had food poisoning since. Yeah. And it's the same with alcoholism. I get yeah. a few simple steps to there and make sure I never suffer from that stuff again. Which leads me to my next question. So that was a perfect lead in because my next question is, what are some of your sober disciplines? Because those are the steps, you know, the sober disciplines that, that you, you know, do on a regular basis that help to keep you sober. I have a set routine, which, which stuff uh, obviously slotted in around. So the first thing I do when I get up, how can I, how can I feel good when I get up and complete the first task of the day? I make my bed. Mm -hmm. period so i make my bed that's done i go in the shower come out i do my prayers and i do what's called mirror work uh, which i stand in front of the mirror still today and say 10 times i love you i let's say 10 times so when i first started it my brain was laughing and i was laughing a bit embarrassed but mm -hmm. you know if i tell you a lie often enough you're gonna believe it. and if i tell you a lie real often enough i'm gonna start to believe it mm -hmm. so it's all about self-dialogue so i will do that mm -hmm. throughout the day uh, i have to help another alcoholic so i call them I call my sponsor. I compliment three people a day. Mm -hmm. And I do a one kind deed that nobody knows that it's a kind deed. Mm -hmm. When I retire at nighttime, having been good and nice to everybody, I don't get into arguments anymore. I just do what I've got to do. I review my day. Mm -hmm. Have I hurt anybody? Could I have done better? And am I carrying anything I don't need to carry? Because we're back to resentments, which will kill me. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we had a girl that came in and she didn't do as she told and she stormed out and uh, her father came and wanted $10,000. He was going to sue us for $10,000. Now, there is no way if we went to court would he have got anything at all. In fact, we could have stuck him for about half a million dollars worth of court costs by the time we got there. What I did was I took a checkbook out and asked him how much he wanted and he sent $10,000 and I wrote a check right there for $10,000. Now, people say, you are crazy for doing that. Well, I'm not going to live with that for the next 12 months or two years, fighting that on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, because that's bad for me as a person. So it was, it was, I know my makeup today. I know the causes and conditions that, that cause my failure today regarding alcohol. So I have to do what's best. So the big book has a great line. It says, we have to act the good Samaritan every day. And that took me a long time, Dr. Foster, because I was a fighting person. I grew up on, on the project, you know, I mean, I was a big fighting guy and that's why I've always felt like an imposter when I went to Oxford. I mean, I come from a poor family. Why would I be in Oxford? I was always the imposter syndrome has always been with me and I have to be careful of that as well. There's one thing I know today and I wish you'd have found out 20 years ago, but I've only just realized this in the last two or three years. And when I come to peace with this, life got so much better. And that is never going to be blonde enough. I'm never going to be tall enough. I'm never going to be thin enough. And I'm never going to be rich enough. And as long as I keep that in mind, my traits of alcoholism ease a little bit because I never fit in anymore and I'm never good enough. You know, we talk about the brain holding on. I did a talk in California. Uh, there was a thousand people there, which they can't really sit. There's a thousand people in tonight. It's going to be awesome. So I did the talk, a two hour talk, and uh, a standing ovation. It was phenomenal, as usual. I come off stage and it's there. Uh, they, they've got to come to the speaker and shake his hand, you know, and say, good job. And 999 people did. And one person came up and said, you were terrible. You were too loud. And I want my money back. 
and for the next six months have a guest who I concentrated on mm. for one person. And that brings down to self-sabotage and addictive brain. Mm -hmm. Because I will keep hold of that. And wherever I do a talk or TV, in the limousine, back to the plane or whatever, I'm always pulling apart. Did I do this right? Did I say that? Did... It's just a trait. And I need to know them traits today. And it gets me through the day. Mm -hmm. I have a daily reprieve. So I'll look the word reprieve at once. And it says, a stay of execution. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I, today, it's unbelievable. Because today, I... But I've just had my hair cut, but I, I dye my hair blonde, I wear crazy colored scrubs, I drive extortionally stupid cars, I live in a crazy house. I refuse to get home. I'm living my life to the full, out loud, really out loud. I mean, I'm not anonymous whatsoever. I mean, I, I regard and protect everyone else's and anonymity to the meetings I go, but I'm living my life. I'm so lucky because I get two lives in one lifetime. Right. And it's just amazing. And to cap it all, because people go, well, what about your daughters? You know, 18 months ago, my eldest daughter got in touch with me on Facebook. And I've been over to England three, four times. I've held my granddaughter, who was uh, one at the time. And that today, I have a fantastic relationship with my daughter. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that's all because I'm, I work with other people that suffer from my disease aggressively. Mm -hmm. And I am an aggressive person when I'm talking to the disease. Mm -hmm. it's just phenomenal I love my life today that's beautiful thank you so what would you say if you had to pick just like identify what you believe are the most important elements for um for someone who is seeking to recover like what are the most critical elements if you had to pick a few what would you say well, for the actual person that's going through it, you've got a lot for depression. You've got, I mean, alcoholism is a depressant. So if you're, if you're drinking too much and people always come up and go, how do you really drink too much? You know, you know, if you're drinking too much, mm -hmm. this is that gut feeling that goes back to the tribal days. Mm -hmm. It's a real feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, when, the, when someone used to get a gut feeling and wake the rest of the tribe up. It's the same with us today. Listen to that somatic experience. Listen to your body. It will tell you. Call somebody. Call up somebody and go, hey, think I've got a problem with alcohol. I'm depressed because of it. How can I change my life? And there's loads of help out there. And what I'm going to do before this session is, just for the guys that listen to you, is I'm going to give my personal cell phone out. And if you're struggling, call me. A 15-minute conversation is not going to cost you anything. I will change your life in 15 minutes. I'll give you some great advice and some great direction. But you have to, don't sit there, especially men. Then mm -hmm. I can't talk to anybody about this. I think I have a problem. But mm -hmm. one of the reasons I went down to homelessness and the loss of kids and all the abandonment is to try and help you not to do the same. Right. So these are the signs. For moms and dads uh, of teens, as we get into an epidemic with the teens and the drinking, look for isolation. Look for any change in behavior. Look for them being unkempt. Look for them staying in the room for a period of time, missing lunches, missing dinner at weekend, missing church, that stuff. Get help as soon as possible. It's never too early to seek help. Mm -hmm. I often hear, well, he was not ready. That's fine. But the seed has been planted. And now we all know to watch, especially if alcoholism or addiction is in the family. Family, it is hereditary. We've found out that. So you, not everybody may skip a generation. Mm -hmm. I know a brother and sister who are twins. One's an alcoholic. One doesn't suffer at all. So mm -hmm. just be careful and watch for the signs. Okay. Thank you. And it's interesting that you mentioned the tribe and previously you had talked about the injury and how if we really like go back far enough, we can see how the injury started with the way, sometimes the way that we're treated as children by our parents. And, and um, I, I bring it up because I was told recently about this tribe in Africa, and I think they're called the Mumbai tribe. I'm not, I'm not. 100% of the name, but I think it's the Mumbai tribe. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of this, but it's this tribe where if anybody um, does anything within the tribe that is, you know, considered to be outside of the realm of what's acceptable, you know, they're, um, they actually take that person rather than having a prison or, you know, a uh, harsh punishment or anything like that. They take the individual and they put them in the center of the tribe and everybody within the tribe sits there and tells them 
how wonderful they are until they believe it themselves. They tell wow. them what a good person they are and how um, how grateful they are that they're a part of the, the group. And, and they just do that. They continue to do that until that person actually believes it themselves. And they believe that's the best approach to helping somebody to um, not then uh, act out on deviant behavior. And so I, I just think that you know, although that, of course, that's a lot easier to do within like a small tribe in Africa. It's a little difficult to do on a larger scale, but I think it really speaks to a lot of, you know, the way that we do things backwards. You know, things are just really backwards when it comes to how we treat people, especially with addiction issues. So I have a, just a couple more questions I want to make sure I hit on everything. What, um, what would you say? For you personally, Dr. Kelly, was the hardest part about recovering? The hardest part for me was loving myself. Um, always uh, down on myself, and that I love using the mirror 10 times has, has been happening over, over, over a 20 something year period. So, yeah, it was loving myself and um, accepting that I had a disease for which is no cure, but it's manageable. Again, go back to the food poisoning. Mm -hmm. And once I took that on board, life become easy because I have to fight ceasing everything. I wanted to fight everybody and everything about this. Mm -hmm. And I still want today when someone cuts me up on the road, it's like, it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know? It really is going to be okay. And, and you, you find that when you're kind to people, first of all, when I say thank you to somebody, dopamine is released into my brain. Mm -hmm. Me likes dopamine just like any other addict or alcoholic out there. So I started to say thank you a lot more. And really interesting what you just said about the tribe because I'm a great believer that, you know, if someone messes up, what's the point in scolding them? What's the point in, you know, pointing them out and embarrassing? It's like the guys that relapse to come back in with the head between, the, you know, tail between the legs. And I, I, you know, I expect everyone to go there, there, there. Come on, I clung to one side. This is the best thing you've ever done. Yeah. This could be the future of you and, and, and it's the talk. But we're down to dialogue again. We're down to them words that can change people's life. There was a, there was a, a guy, a Chinese guy that did some water. I don't know if you've heard about this. They did water experiments over a period of five years. And um, that they, they would talk to water, like 50% of the water kind words and 50% of other water um, with real bad insults. And the 50% the that were kind words, the molecules were actually healthy and better in that water. Yeah. Which if we're 70% water, can you imagine what we can do when we understand the power of words? Mm -hmm. it's unbelievable it Absolutely. really is unbelievable but going back to the childhood thing you just spoke about it's like we took i took a patient on once and he'd been to see everybody and they couldn't figure out what the scene what we call the scene of the crime was what was that defining moment that's been ruining you for the last 30 years right. and he told me about um his dad was a marathon runner and very competitive very competitive so he got the son who i'm going to call greg he got greg uh into running and he'd run for the school. And in, in, in his high school, there was a race. And there were only five people, because it was like five miles or something. And the first three people got a t-shirt, first, second, and third. Mm -hmm. Well, by one and a half seconds, he came in fourth. So his dad not only didn't speak to him for a week, but actually scolded him for not trying hard enough and really looked down him. So we figured out, and when he found out this, he actually broke down. We figured that for the last 30 years, he's been chasing that T-shirt. Mm -hmm. And when he found out that, he realized that everybody wants to, to do best for dad. You know, every guy, probably every woman from mom, I, I, you know, everybody wants to do the best. And when parents, you know, put that down or put them down, or they don't make him feel good enough for whatever reason. And I'm a true believer. I'm in my 50s now. Our parents dropped the ball. I don't know whether it was the war. I don't know whether what was going on. But my father never showed any affection. And the people I speak that speak of my era, fathers didn't do that. You know, they went away to war, they came back, and there was no affection. That damaged me as, as a teen and an adult. Yeah. You know, I never, I never saw my mom argue with dad. Mm -hmm. So I also took that on board. Yeah. But when me and my wife, Janet, got married, we only only been married for five years, but we, we, we got married, and, and this is the sprout off from recovering from alcoholism, right. is the third or fourth day, something happened, and we kind of snapped at each other. And, I, I, and she said to me, well, that's just the way marriage is. 
And one of my biggest sayings is, says who? Mm -hmm. And we both looked at each other and I said, who's these people that keep making these rules? Let's make our own rules for life and marriage. And we did. We always dance in the morning in the bathroom with each other. We mm -hmm. always, you know, jump in the pool together, holding hands. We do all these crazy things that yeah. shouldn't be done after X amount of years of being married, especially right. when you're in your 50s. Says who? Right. You know, let's start making your own life. It's like, I always think about that movie where that, that he's in like a TV set, all these like, I just think about that is how far can I push this crazy life? Mm -hmm. How far can I push it? And I love seeing people. I love seeing people succeed mm -hmm. and I love seeing people get over the season realizing that there's life after mm -hmm. addiction and alcoholism because there is, it's only just the beginning. Right. An incredible life too. Yeah. Absolutely. So incredible. what would you say is the, for you, if you could pick one thing and I know it's really hard, but if you could pick one thing, what would you say is the best for you personally? is the best part of being recovered giving back giving back giving back without a doubt we we, yeah. we i think i said before we we gave two hundred fifty thousand dollars back last year and we'll continue to do so the couple of things we do here at, at the uh, at the company is one we set aside an amount that we're going to donate to everybody whoever wants help and mm -hmm. secondly we take on 30 percent pro bono for people who can't afford our services mm -hmm. so that's what we do but giving back is is one of the foundations of my recovery because I remember being on the streets, I remember begging for 10 pence, which is like 10 cents, you know, of people. And I, I, I used to do multi-million dollar deals and now I'm doing 10 cent deals. Mm -hmm. And the humiliation of not being able to feed your child or the humiliation of not being able to buy a, a Christmas present. I met a girl in AA and she was crying. and She just got her children back, mm -hmm. ages four and 10 or something like that. And she was crying because she couldn't give them a proper Christmas present. So after the meeting, I went over to her and I says, get in the car. I'm going to take you somewhere. You're going to have to trust me. Here's my license. Here's who I am. Jump on the internet. You know, everyone knows who I am. And we took her to a toy store and we spent $500 worth of toys for her kids. And people would often say, are you having an affair with her? Or, you know, what are you getting out of that? Why are you doing that? Why? Because I can. That's why. Because when I was on the streets, that humiliation, it's hard. It breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. to know that people can't afford. And the other thing we did a couple of months ago was we was horrified when we saw on the local news that kids were being turned away at uh, school lunches because their lunch debt, because of a lunch debt, had not been paid. And we were flabbergasted. So we picked a local school and we called them up at random and we said, uh, do you have a lunch debt? And, the, and the, the principal came on and said, yes, we do. I says, well, he, he, that name's Dr. Kelly, and this is our company, and we'd like to pay your lunch debt off. And he said, but well, you don't know how much it is. And I said, it doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. and, and I heard a grown man cry mm -hmm. that day on the phone. And we went in, and it was a substantial amount, but we made sure that for the next 12 months, no kid ever got turned back from that, from that table. Never. We not only paid, we paid forward as well for the next 12 months, so they'd never be in. Nobody knew about that. We didn't get the. We could have got the TV down and everything. It's giving back. It's like whatever you can. A wise man once told me, Doctor Foster, that you'll never go broke by giving away. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be true for me, anyway. Yeah, and and I think that what you've described over the course of our interview so far. I mean, clearly you work a, a twelve-step recovery program. Yes, that's clear. Yes. And and you described very clearly your spiritual awakening that happened, your spiritual experience, which basically is that shift in perspective, the way in which you look at the world. And I, and I generally ask people the spirituality question, like what do you, you know, do you feel that spirituality has had an impact on your recovery? How do you view spirituality? But I think I already have the answer to that question based upon what you've shared so far in that it's all about spiritual practice and, and service and giving to others is such a huge part of that spiritual practice. Is there anything else I'm missing in that? No, no I, the only thing that, that I would cover was that I play down on interviews that the actual impact of the spiritual life. I've got uh, God of mind, the conception of God is mine, could right. be any, any God. It's a God that looks after me. And there has been, not only when I was on the streets, 
there's been so many incidences while I've been sober that it's really hard for anybody to come to me and say, I'm sorry, but I, I don't think there's any God looking after you. For instance, I got taken in two years after being here, living in Dallas. I started to, I wasn't feeling too good. I started to vomit blood. And they called the ambulance and they rushed me to hospital. And after a few tests, uh, they found out, the doctor came in and he says, okay, uh, do you have moms and dads or wives? So I said, well, this is my wife, she's American, but I have mom and dad back in England. She said, we need to call them. So my wife's wife said, well, you have cancer of the esophagus and we are going to operate. And the success of you coming out of it because it's such a delicate operation is not great. So we need to inform you next of kin, which was my parents. Mm -hmm. So um, we all called them. The doctor called my parents from, from this hospital. I won't name it. And I just spoke to them. And my mom had cancer at this point. She was dying of it. And there was tears and hysterics and tears. And, and the doctor spoke to them. And, and then we all finished, and my wife was crying in the corner. She just kept saying, no, no, God hasn't finished with you yet, no. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, God had gone through the window. I was just like, this is it. I was terrified. And then they gave me a needle and went under. Uh, when I came round, thank God I came round, there was now seven doctors in the room with four or five guys in, in suits. And they all looked terrified. So I thought something's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. They pushed a notebook in front of me with a pen and paper, and my wife said, just sign it. And I was confused. She said, just sign it. And I signed it. And what it was, it was a disclosure not to sue them because they'd taken me down and did one more final scan before they opened me up, and they couldn't find the cancer. So in a matter of four or five hours, I don't know, they couldn't find it. First of all, it was there. Then it wasn't there. Mm. And that's not just one. There are loads of incidents like that that I can't explain. Right. what's happened so the spiritual side is like 99.9 .9 of my recovery in life because god really looks after me and mm -hmm. I just, i've seen too many miracles i really have when i when i work with other people yeah. i've seen some crazy things happen that just now i just go oh, there we go again yeah. but it's just crazy but it's like anything it's like maintenance of my car it has to be a spiritual maintenance on a daily basis for me right. and the complacency because you know, I have to walk into my office because Rock Kelly Recovery Group is, is on a huge wall as you walk into the reception. And I often go in there, and I've never told anybody this before, on a Sunday, and I sit there, and I sob, and I sob, and I sob. Because I can't believe that this has happened. Mm -hmm. I can't believe When they took my children off me, I thought my life had ended. Mm -hmm. I thought that was it. And yet, I, I'm here today, and it's just like, it's just like I'm living a dream. Mm -hmm. you know? I have, I have a saying, we have t-shirts as well, but I come up with a saying is uh, stop dreaming of living and start living the dream. Because that's all you still on the streets. So it's a dream of, I used to walk past people, especially at Christmas time, and watch families open presents or eat dinner, you know, through the window with a nice light and it was lovely and warm and I'd be freezing to death. And mm -hmm. I just thought that was a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. I really did. And then all of a sudden it started happening to me. And, you know, I did that, that's one of the reasons why I have homeless alcoholics who go to meetings around at my house for Christmas lunch mm -hmm. and people where I'm from it's there's not a house under a million around here it's like you must be crazy you don't know these guys right and I'm thinking to myself well I kind of do yeah you know? right <laughs> yeah exactly so a couple like three more quick questions okay because I know we're running out of time one is what would be advice I know you've given a lot of advice throughout the interview but what would be some advice that you would give to somebody who's struggling or somebody who's brand new we'll get to the end where I'm sure you're gonna give your phone number and all of that stuff and I'm going to of course include all of your contact information in the description but what would you if you had to give somebody just some quick advice what would you say don't be ashamed don't be ashamed that you're suffering from something you didn't think nobody else has got or you're alone. Don't be ashamed. There are millions of people like you. It's a well-known accepted disease today. Call somebody, get help, go and see your doctor, talk to a friend, just seek a closed mouth person and go, hey, this is what I'm going on. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Don't be, don't be, don't sit there in shame thinking yeah. that you dare approach anybody. Because mm -hmm. you can. Right. Exactly. Thank you. What about family members? What kind of advice would you give to family members? There's all, somebody always knows somebody. So there's a good chance that somebody in the family unit 
is suffering. So again, if, if, if it's a son or daughter or husband or, or wife, seek help, you know, call us. We'll, we'll point you in the right direction. Don't be, again, don't be ashamed. You know, your child's drinking too much. He's getting in trouble with drugs. It's the kids he's hanging around with. Change the kids he's hanging around with. Mm-hmm. Don't let them grow up like this. It can be changed if you catch it at an early age. You can turn that addicted brain round to some of the most amazing CEOs of multi-million dollar companies right. are alcoholics and recovery. A lot, a lot of people know this because the addicted brain is very, very smart. Yeah. And it, it, we, may, we make a great job of drinking. We, get, we make a great job of, of becoming an alcoholic. We can switch that around. And once that neural pathway switch from self-sabotage to self-care, you can go on to be anything and anybody you want. So let's get rid of the shame. Yes, let's get, let's get help as quick as possible for these guys. Absolutely. And if you could put your legacy in a sentence or two, what would you, how would you describe it? What would you want it to be? I was the person that would always listen. Mm-hmm. I'm, the, I'm the last stop on the block. Mm-hmm. When you've given up and you got to me and I sat down with you, and said, I understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you've never lost your children, Rob. Check. Yeah, but you've never been homeless, Rob. Check. All the stuff. So that when the guy who's run out of options and just wants to die, I want to be known to that guy. Dr. Rob Kelly is the guy that sat down and been through everything, who understood. He don't even know me, but he's walked in my shoes so many times, and I felt so comfortable with him. Mm-hmm. And of course, before, I'm in San Antonio now, Texas, before I actually leave this earth, I want a 300 bed rehab that's funded by the government that's free of charge to everybody who wants to recover from their disease. That's the legacy I want. It's going to be called Rob Kellen Recovery Group Treatment Center or something like that. But I just want people to know that I've, I've been through it and I spent the rest of my life trying to help somebody else not to go through it. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. That'll be wonderful. So I have no doubt <laughs> that you yes. will see that. So is there anything, Dr. Kelly, that I haven't asked you so far that, um, that you feel is information that you would like to share? Uh, just, uh, you know, anybody going out there, anybody feeling depressed, anybody who has bipolar, which all comes with alcoholism, by the way, anybody that's suffering from trauma, anybody that's sat there right now debating whether to kill themselves or not, guys, this life can be phenomenal. If you're going through something today, pause. And start your day over again. You could be three o'clock in the afternoon. Stop. Mm-hmm. Start your day over again. Mm-hmm. When you get up in the morning, say these words, and I promise you, I guarantee you, if not, call me up. I've got plenty of money for you here. You call me up. I've never got this has been here for years. No one's claimed it yet. And <laughs> say to yourself, today is going to be an amazing day. Yeah. And watch that day be an amazing day. Because mm-hmm. it's all in the mind. Yeah. See, what happened yesterday, I was miserable, but today I'm not. What's, what's changed? Nothing's changed apart from perspective on the day. Right. Get up, get out yourself, help somebody. It's a well-known fact from mirroring. If I walk into a room with 10 people with a frown on my face, most people are going to frown back. Mm-hmm. But if I walk in with a smile on my face, most people are going to smile back. Yeah. Be the smile. Yeah. Don't wait. Be the smile. Be that person. And I'll finish on this. You know, me and my friend was picking out some pictures of when we were kids. And he got all the one picture and we both stood out behind this brewery or something and we got our overalls on or something. And he said to me, oh God, remember those days? Those were the days, Rob, weren't they? Those were the days. We had no idea at the time that we'd look back and go, those were the days. So I say to people today, today could be one of those days. Mm -hmm. Today could be the day when you pick up a picture and go, look, remember those days. So realize it today. Realize that today is one of those days. And do something that's outside your comfort zone and move forward. Mm-hmm. If you're on $40,000 a year, guys, but you want to earn 50, hang around the guys that earn 50. Mm-hmm. Hang around them guys that you want to be mm-hmm. and you will become. Just like you hang around the bad kids at school, right. you become a bad kid. Hang around the good kids. Hang around the guys that are smiling upbeat all the time. Mm-hmm. All the time. Because that's what it's P. People say, you're on a pink cloud, Rob. Ah, that's fine. I've been on a pink cloud for 27 years. So mm-hmm. I'm pretty cool. Thank you. I'll stay yeah. on this pink cloud. Because it's all about perspective. You are what you think you are and you attract what you think you're worth. Right. Realize your worth. Someone said, how much you charge an hour, Rob? I don't know. 50,000? That's what I'm worth. 
Now, what would I charge you? That's completely different. Right. But what I'm worth is different because I know my worth today. Find out your worth, guys. You know, if you're sat there on a Sunday night and you get that gut feeling of, oh, my God, we've got work tomorrow. You need another job, guys. Yeah. If you're coming on to a wife and going, oh, my God, she's going to be there nagging. You need another wife. Yeah. You know, I went to bed when I was 20 and I got home when I was 50. That's how quick life passes you by. Mm -hmm. Make the most out of it. Go out there, enjoy. Make somebody laugh. Be the smile. Mm -hmm. I've just come up with that in my head now. I'm going to have a t-shirt. Be the smile that inspires somebody today. Yeah. Yeah. And do that mirror work because you're the first person that I've met who shared with me that you do mirror work and I do mirror work yes. every day. And I can I, tell by your reaction that you do that every day. Yeah. I share my warrior Wednesday where I take a selfie in the mirror and, and share my mantra, my affirmation for the day. And I know that like a lot of people probably are like, you know, who does she think she is and blah, blah, blah. But I, I don't know if you've ever heard of Louise Hay. Yes. But she's the one who introduced me to mirror work through her book, her book, You Can Heal Your Life. And, and it's worked for me. I, I love it. So yeah, I'm so um, grateful that you shared that and that you've shared everything. Um, it's been, it's been great. So I thank you so much for spending your time with me today. And I know that there are a lot of people who are going to get a lot out of this video. So thank you so much again, Dr. Kelly, for being here. I really appreciate My it. My pleasure. Absolutely. It's been awesome. Yeah. Absolutely awesome. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you again to Dr. Kelly for the time that he spent with me today and for you spending time with us today. If you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, be sure to click on the red subscribe now button. And when the bell pops up, click on the bell and you will be alerted to all of my upcoming videos. Also definitely check the description section below because I've included lots of helpful links, ways in which you can get in touch with Dr. Kelly and also some free resources that I provide to you as well. So be sure to check that out and be sure to join me back here next week when I'll have another hopefully amazing interview for you. And in the meantime, I wish you a very beautiful and a blessed week. Namaste.